Alright, thanks for watching. And today I want to tell you about the fact that's not only too good to be true, but it is too good and it is true. Namely, I want to show you that if you have a continuous function on R that is one-to-one, -one, then in fact, it's either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. And for this, let me set up some terminology. So remember, one-to-one -one means the following. So f is one-to-one -one if two different inputs give you two different outputs. So in terms of airplanes, it just means that if you start at two different airports, x and y, then you end up at two different airports, f of x and f of y. And this is good. In other words, there's no clash happening in some sense. Moreover, there's a definition of increasing. So f is strictly increasing if a less than b implies f of a is less than f of b. So it preserves the order in some sense, and that's very important for what's come soon. And it's strictly decreasing if a less than b implies f of a is bigger than f of b. Okay. So just in terms of pictures, we have the following. So increasing just means if a is less than b, then f of a is less than f of b. And decreasing means if a is less than b, then f of a is less than f of b. So f of a is greater than f of b. All right, and as promised, I want to show you the following fact. So fact, if f from i, so i is any interval in the real numbers, to r is continuous and one-to-one, -one. then f is monotone. Meaning monotone just means increasing or decreasing. And let me give you a little application of this. So that's very neat because now you can just quickly check for increasing or decreasing without even using derivatives. That's kind of cool. Because for instance, take f of x equals sine of x on the interval 0 comma pi over 2. 0 comma pi over 2. Okay. Then you can show that this function is continuous and one-to-one. -one. And therefore, by this theorem, this tells you that f is either increasing or decreasing. However, well, let's just test sine of x at two points. Let's say the endpoints. This is 0 and this is pi over 2. Then what do we know? We know f of 0, that is 0 because it's sine of zero, but f of pi over two, that is sine of one, sine of pi over two, which is one. So the point is, f of one is bigger than f of zero. So the function cannot be decreasing, because this is bigger than that. Therefore, it must be increasing. So by this theorem, we actually get that sine of x is increasing. And again, without using any derivatives. Pretty neat, in my opinion. Also, I want to tell you, so this theorem, I know it sounds amazing, but hopefully it's more or less obvious, because here's the thing. Suppose the function is not increasing or decreasing. Then, for instance, the function may look like this. It goes up, and then it goes down. But then it cannot be one-to-one, -one because you see, here we have two inputs, that give you the same output. And therefore, if f is continuous and one-to-one, -one, then this cannot happen. So it has to be increasing or decreasing. And now without further ado, let's prove this fact. So proof. And it goes in a bunch of steps. So step one, I want to prove what I like to call the chain condition. 
and you'll see why it's called like that. So fact, I want to show that if you have a triple a less than b less than c, then one of the following holds. Either f of a is less than f of b is less than f of c, or f of a is bigger than f of b is bigger than f of c. So maybe in terms of a picture, right? what I want to show is the following. If I give you any three numbers, a, b, and c, that are ordered like that, or a, b, and c ordered like that, then either f of a is less than f of b is less than f of c, or the opposite scenario, f of a, is bigger than f of b, is bigger than f of c. Now, very important, if f is increasing, then this is true. If f is decreasing, then this is true. But remember, we don't know if f is increasing or decreasing. So this is already a good step towards showing that f is monotonic. And let's prove this. So, all right. um, suppose not, then then um, there is some triplet a b and a less than b less than c such that. Well, f of b is either bigger than f of a and f of c, or f of b is smaller than f of a and f of c. And I'll illustrate this with pictures. So such that either f of b is at least greater or equal than f of a and f of c, or f of b is less than or equal to f of a and f of c. So in other words, um, if this chain condition is not true, then it means that if, for instance, you have this scenario, this is f of a, f of c, then f of b is greater than f of c, or the other scenario. So if this is f of a and f of c, then f of b is less than f of a and f of c. And of course, there are similar situations where this is smaller than that. But the point is, it can only be one of those uh, scenarios. So without loss of generality, assume we're in the first case. So suppose that, that f of b is greater or equal to f of a and f of c. But notice, because a is not equal to b, f of b cannot be equal to f of a, and also f of b cannot be equal to f of c. So in fact, we were strictly greater than. And let me redraw that picture. So which scenario are we in? So suppose we have here a, b, and c, and again, this is f of a, f of b, huge, and an f of c. Kind of like the same scenario as the idea of the proof that I gave a couple of minutes ago. Then the point is, because this is bigger than that and this is bigger than that, well, there must be some y that is both between f of a and f of b, and between f of b and f of c. So since, therefore, there is y between, uh, that is, there is some y that is both between between 
f of a and f of b, and between f of b and f of c. But here's the thing. In particular, the intermediate value theorem tells us that there's some x1 here, such that f of x1 equals y, and there's some x2 here, such that f of x2 equals y, but this blatantly contradicts the fact that f is one-to-one, -one, because there would be two different inputs that give you the same output y. So, therefore, by IVT, since f is continuous, there is x1 in the open integral AB with f of x1 equals y and x2 in the integral BC with f of x2 equals y. But then the point is, then uh, x1 is not equal to x2 because they're in two different intervals, but f of x1 equals f of x2, and that equals y. And that literally contradicts the fact that f is 1 to 1. And therefore, we're done with the proof of the claim. So definitely we know if A is less than B less than C, then there's some order to F of A, F of B, and F of C. So again, therefore now we know that A less than B less than C implies either F of A less than F of B less than F of C, or F of A is bigger than F of B is bigger than F of C. All right, just be a little bit careful. It is not obvious from that that f is increasing or decreasing. Because what do we know? We know that if I give you a, b, and c, then we have either this or that. So in this picture, we have f of a, f of b, f of c. However, it is certainly possible that for the same function and some other triplet, the other condition holds. That you see, we have a, b, and c here, but here the first thing holds. And in this case, notice f is not monotonic. So really what we have to show, we have to show that no matter which triple we have, exactly one of those two conditions holds. You see, either we only have this, no matter what A, B, and C are, or we only have this, no matter what A, B, and C are. And that is the point of the second step. So, step two. And for this, let's fix two numbers, which I like to call helper numbers. So fix a naught and b naught in i with a naught less than b naught. So in our previous example, a naught was 0 and b naught was pi over 2. Well, then what do we have? Well, a naught is not equal to b naught, so definitely f of a naught is not equal to f of b naught. And so in particular, we only have one of those two scenarios. f of a naught is less than f of b naught, or f of a naught is bigger than f of b naught. So in our example, this f of that was less than f of that. So without loss of generality, assume we as this, this first thing, and let's show, in fact, that f is increasing. And therefore, without loss of generality, assume that the first thing holds. f of a naught is less than f of b naught, because the other case is similar, but this will help us show that f is increasing, the other case will show that f is decreasing. So suppose this is a naught and this is b naught, and then this is f of a naught, and this is f of b naught. Just like 
before we showed sine of zero was less than sine of pi over two, and we concluded that sine is increasing. Now, I want to show now the following. The following that was help us prove that f is increasing, but it's not equivalent to f increasing. And I want to show simply the following, namely, if x is less than a naught, then f of x is less than f of a naught. And similarly, if x is bigger than a naught, then f of x is bigger than f of a naught. It sounds the same as increasing, but it's not because you see here the a naught is fixed. We want it to hold for every variable if you want. All right, and here's the proof. Well, case one, just assume x is less than a naught. Then what do we have? So this is x, this is a naught, and remember this is b naught. So in fact, we have all those three things. And therefore, by the chain condition, either f of x is less than f of a naught is less than f of b naught, or the reverse. However, we know that f of a naught is less than f of b naught. So the only way, only possibility that can happen is that this is less than that. Because if this were greater, then we wouldn't have this chain condition. So by step one, so from step one and f of a naught less than f of b naught, we must have the possibility that f of x is less than f of a naught and it's less than f of b naught. All right, and in particular, we have the result that we want. We have that f of x is less than f of a naught. So in that case, we're done. And then case two, suppose x is bigger than a naught, but then here we have to argue in terms of whether x is bigger than b naught or not. So again, suppose this is x, uh, sorry, suppose this is a naught, this is x, and let's say this is b naught. So if uh, x is less than b naught, then we have a naught is less than x is less than b naught. But the point is, since f of a naught is less than f of b naught, again, by this chain condition, f of x has to be in the middle of the two. So by step one, we have f of a naught less than f of x less than f of b naught. Okay. And therefore, in particular, we get that f of x is bigger than f of a naught, which is what we wanted to show in this step. All right, similarly, well, if x equals b naught, so if we're in this situation, a naught, b naught, and that's also x, then it's actually even easier than by assumption we know f of a naught is less than f of b naught, but that's the same thing as f of x. And therefore f of x is bigger than f of a naught. And lastly, if x is bigger than b naught, so we have the following a naught, b naught, and x, then it is similar to this case because you see this is smaller than that and therefore this f of x has to be even bigger. So uh, f of x must be bigger than f of b naught, must be bigger than f of a naught. And so in particular, f of x is bigger than f of a naught. All right, so we're done with this second step and now let's show the third step I know uh, it's quite a long proof, but the steps themselves are not hard, it's just there are a lot of them. Um, so step three, so claim f is increasing. Well, and for this, suppose 
x1 is less than x2 and show f of x1 is less than f of x2. Well, here again, it depends on whether x1 and x2 are less than a0 or bigger than a0, basically. So case one, assume that x1 is less than x2 is less than a0. So we have this scenario, x1 less than x2 less than a0. But then the point is, in particular, we have x2 is less than a0. So by step two, f of x2 is less than f of a0. So you see, this thing is less than that. But then by the first step, we must have that this is less than, than those two. So by step one, just apply if you want f here, f of x1 is less than f of x2 is less than f of a0. But then we're done. Because then we have f of x1 is less than f of x2. All right, so that's the first case. The second case is if one is less than a0 and the other one is bigger than a0, so basically we have x1 less than or equal to a0 less than or equal to x2. Okay. So kind of like this. This is x1, this is a0, and this is x2. Right. Then look at this following here. So either x1 is strictly less than a0, so if x1 is strictly less than a0, then f of x1 is strictly less than f of a0 by step 2. Or x1 is equal to a0, in which case that f of x1 equals to f of a0. Okay. But then, in particular, if you combine those two, we do get that x1 less than or equal to a0, that does imply f of x1 is less than or equal to f of a0. And similarly, x2 greater or equal to a0, that implies f of x2 is greater or equal to f of a0. All right, and therefore combining, we get f of x1, well, it's less than or equal to f of a0, is less than or equal to f of x2, and therefore f of x1 is less than or equal to f of x2. However, remember, since x1 is less than x2, x1 is not equal to x2, so f of x1 is not equal to f of x2. So if this is less than or equal to that, but not equal to that, we actually get f of x1 is strictly less than f of x2. Very good. And in that case, we're done. And last case, well, suppose we have, maybe here, Suppose you have the following, so uh, x1 is less than x2 is greater than a0. So here on the other side, right? Adele says, hello from the other side. Well, then it's similar to uh, case one. And therefore, also in this case, we get f of x1 is less than f of x2, so that's good. And therefore, f is increasing, and we're done, and we can stay home happy. So f is increasing, and then we're done. Ta-da! So we're done with the result. All right, thank you very much.